This is CBC Here and Now. It's definitely life changing. It's, it's a lot of sleepless nights. I didn't want to know. Was it done intentionally? Was it an accident? Switched at birth and brought together by chance five decades later. Tonight, an incredible story of the unimaginable. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. We are starting differently tonight with an unbelievable story about family. Two men whose lives took a wrong turn early and it took 50 years before anybody realized what had actually happened. Here and Now's Mark Quinn brings you his astonishing story. Its title is By Chance. It's definitely life changing. It's, it's a lot of sleepless nights. I didn't want to know. Was it done intentionally? Was it an accident? We just, like, we're still having a hard time with it. You got a million questions that you'll never have answers to. This is a story about families, about two little boys, about mums and dads. The boys grew up in happy times, in happy families, but they didn't know a secret something that happened way back at the very beginning. Imagine the unimaginable. Your life, those memories, that family, that life you lived was supposed to be someone else's. And it all happened by chance. Clarence Hines is opening up about something painful. It isn't easy to talk about. It's something he rejected at first and is still trying to accept. This is the 11th house that Clarence has built. Hard work, but nothing compared to learning his identity was built on a mistake that's still rippling through two large families. Picture here, me and mom. Growing up, everyone said I looks, looks like mom, right? Clarence may look like her, but she's not the woman who gave birth to him. I love my parents, because yeah. basically I, my parents was everything growing up. But now, everything he thought he knew about them and the brothers and sisters he grew up with in St. Bernard's has been turned upside down. I went through a hard time a couple of winters ago. After Clarence was born at the Come By Chance Cottage Hospital, he was sent home with the wrong family. We're still having a hard time with it. Like some of my family members are still on the own with it now. It's very hard. He was switched at birth with this man, Craig Avery. I don't know how you can describe it. It's, it's so hurtful. It's like your heart is broken all the time. It deprived us of, of our families for 56 years. They were born in Come By Chance on the same day. Somehow, they were sent home with each other's parents. Clarence went home with Craig's birth parents to St. Bernard's. And Craig went home with Clarence's birth parents to this home in Hillview. It's unbelievable that, that something like that could happen. You know, these people are supposed to be professionals and do what they're supposed to do. And, and it was just, to me, utter neglect. This is where it happened. The Come By Chance Cottage Hospital that once stood behind me was torn down in the mid-1980s. But this is where Clarence and Craig's lives first became entangled in 1962. An entanglement that wouldn't have been discovered if it weren't for a series of chance happenings that began 50 years later. The first one happened here. A few years ago, both Craig and Clarence were hired at Bull Arm where they both worked in the same building on the Hebron project. They may have passed each other at work a hundred times without thinking twice until yet another unlikely chance meeting. What's your father doing there? Craig's wife, Tracy Avery, was also hired at Bull Arm, and she's the person who put it all together. My first day there, I saw him, and I went to Craig right away. I said, my God, I said, there's somebody here who looks just like Clifford, which is Craig's brother. She was struck by how much Clarence looks like her husband's brother, Clifford. And then she learned Clarence and Craig have the same birthday. So right away, I'm like, where were you born? And he said, come a chance. I 
just thought that, you know, something was not right. For Clarence and Craig, this wasn't coming completely out of the blue. There had been hints before. Growing up, I was told I didn't look like none of the family that I was growing up with. Courtney was born on Father's birthday. But now it was getting real. Eventually, Craig had a DNA test done that showed he and his brother Clifford couldn't have had the same father. And then, eventually, Clarence had a test that showed his DNA was a 100% match with Clarence's brother, Clifford. The evidence was piling up and it hit Clarence hard. He stayed in bed and didn't leave home for weeks. All this work stopped and he says there were a lot of tears. I broke down and uh, all this plan in my mind and I had to go to my doctor and everything and uh, but I don't know, it's, it's not getting no easier, but... Uh... It's still playing out because they have questions that can never be answered. The Come By Chance Hospital and the people who work there are gone. I can't believe that, that trust in, in the hospital, you go in to have the baby and here they are sending you home with somebody else. That can't be fixed now and they both have family members they'll never know. Clifford, the brother who some said could be Clarence's twin, died after the DNA test. They never met. And their parents, all four of them, died before any of this was known. What hurts a lot is knowing that your parents are gone to their grave and, and they have no idea, right? And they never will. And, and we never ever got to meet our parents. And now, a trip down memory lane that's a pleasure for many people is agony. You never got to be there, special occasions and stuff like that with your brothers and sisters, and you never got to grow up with them. It's hard. It does weigh on Tracy, who questions if she should have pursued this at all. A couple times. Uh, when we've gotten together and stuff, I'm like, do you guys wish that I wouldn't have said anything or that it wouldn't have, and two of them said, no, not at all, because, you know, you got family out there, you need to know that. Craig and Clarence have been spending more time together. They do have a lot of questions for each other. And this year promises to be special, their first Christmas with their newfound families. I had a happy childhood and I had a happy teenage years and growing up everything was good and like they're still my family, right? You know, I got two big I got two big families now. And hopefully one day it'll all be one big family. Well that powerful piece was edited by Paul Pickett and the reporter Mark Quinn is here with me now. It's such an astonishing story, Mark. Has anything like this ever happened before? It really is an incredible story, Anthony. And it's amazing, but we have learned that uh, there were men in Manitoba who had a similar uh, issue. Uh, there were four men who were switched at birth, two different pairs who were switched, and they did uh, sue, and two of them have reached an out of settlement, uh, out of court settlement with the federal government for an undisclosed amount of money. All right, so that's there. What's happening here? There's also a lawsuit here, and we've learned that uh, Craig Avery and Clarence Hine, Hines and many members of their families are also suing Eastern Health for damages, and that's still in court. Um, Eastern Health did give us a comment. It says it empathizes with the men and their families, and it's reviewing their claims. Well, product being made in this small workspace here in Nain is going all over Nunatsiavut. It's meant to save lives. What we're mainly concerned about is it's measuring the sea ice thickness. I'll tell you more about that coming up on Here and Now. Mike. 
excuse me, that's gonna make the blooper real for sure this year. <laughs> okay, let's start again, shall we? We do have some uh, showers turning to flurries tonight in the east. You're gonna be trading your raincoat for your parka tomorrow for sure. In Labrador, dangerously cold wind chill overnight tonight and continuing tomorrow. And we have snow squalls in the east, a special weather statement for tomorrow afternoon. I'll have all those details later. And let's hope we can hear them. Uh, now let's get on to the news of the day. First, they were banned from Powell Airlines. Now they've been banned from Churchill Falls. Tonight, two workers caught making racist remarks are out of their jobs. It happened Monday night on a flight from Happy Valley Goose Bay to St. John's. The pair could be heard making racist and disparaging comments that were directed at Indigenous passengers on the plane. Pal Airlines has banned the men indefinitely, and while Nalcor says it can't control who's hired by its contractors, it can take action when workers behave badly. In a statement, a spokesperson says Nalcor has made great strides in recent years to build relations with Indigenous groups in Labrador, and that the Crown Corporation will not tolerate such behaviour. Nalcor informed Enercon builders today that the men are not permitted at the Churchill Falls site. Now, it seems that Enercon Builders is taking all of this one step further. The St. John's Company, hired to work on Nalcor's hotel in Churchill Falls, fired Cancote Enterprises. And that's the subcontractor where the two men worked. It's necessary to demonstrate to everyone that, you know, this type of behavior is just not acceptable and it just it won't be tolerated. We don't want it, uh, that kind of behavior displayed in public or in private to indigenous groups or against any individual or, or any group. Now, you may have noticed that I said worked for us, past tense. That's because those two men have been fired. The company's president says this is extremely unfortunate and disappointing as the actions of the two employees in no way reflect the values and integrity of the company. Cancote Enterprises does not condone the words or actions of the two employees and their employment has been terminated. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador is poorer than you think. The finance minister gave the mid-fiscal year update today and the province is getting hundreds of millions of dollars less than expected. Here now is Peter Cowan joins us live from our newsroom. So Peter, why the big drop in revenue? Anthony, once again, it's oil and gas that's in the driver's seat and this time it's not good news and that's really to blame. Let's take a look at some of the numbers starting with the deficit. If you leave out the one-time Federal Atlantic Accord payouts, the deficit is up a lot. It's now almost a billion dollars, up from less than 600 million when the budget came out earlier this year. So where is the province getting less money? Well, the Hibernia oil platform had a spill and had to be shut down temporarily, so the province lost out on almost 200 million in royalties. The price of oil is also expected to be lower, so that's costing another $46 million that the province isn't going to get. Now, the rest is really because of a bunch of other small calculations, for example, the way the federal government uh, projects the tax revenue and some projects that the federal government was funding, but the construction may not happen this year, so the revenue gets moved to future years as well. All this to say, the message from the finance minister today was all of this is really out of our control. Where we can have control, we do have control, and that's on cutting expenditures. Um, you know, it is disappointing that we saw a shutdown both last year in the oil industry and, and again this year in the oil industry, and it does have a significant impact on the province's finances. Now, when you talk about f uh, spending, the finance minister said the province is actually spending $24 million less than it projected. Uh, but all of this casts serious doubt about whether the province will be able to get back to a balanced budget by 2022-2023. Some of the plans to save money aren't happening as quickly as expected, and the minister uh, says he doesn't want to make drastic cuts just in order to meet those targets, like, for example, closing down a hospital or shutting down a ferry service. It is a challenge, and you know I, I, I'll be completely honest. I mean, I, I go home uh, sometimes uh, at night, and uh, you know uh, the thought never leaves my mind on how we can get back to surplus. Tom Osborne has promised to help diversify the economy away from oil. He says the government is doing that, but this is something that takes years, so they're not able to see the benefits right away. Anthony. 
As Peter Cowan reporting live from our newsroom now, the news did not go over well with the PCs or the NDP. Here's how they reacted to the province's big loss of revenue. Let's talk about people who could stay home. I mean, royalties are fine in one sense, but I think we need benefits here. We need jobs created in Newfoundland and Labrador. Our deficit is largely right now as a, a function of um, not so much overspending, but oil prices were lower, production was lower. So we have some concerns about that. The weaknesses in the province's financial situation is not what doctors want to hear. They're already shaking their heads in disbelief over a tentative deal between the province and NAEP. And it's not that they're unhappy for government workers who have a new contract extension, but they're frustrated because they've been without a contract for over two years and they can't even get a meeting. Cease Hare reports. Uh, there's going to be an increase in wages. That's something we said that we couldn't accept status quo. NAEP announced a two-year contract extension Tuesday as doctors sit on the sidelines, unable to get a start date in their negotiations. Uh, the issue that a second consecutive uh, collective agreement has been negotiated with NAEP at a time when uh, our members have not even seen us go to the bargaining table once. Fitzgerald says their contract expired over two years ago and the disrespect shown to her members really started this fall with a meeting with Health Minister John Hagee. His assertion was that it was really Minister of Finance that was responsible for negotiating, which has been uh, the history. Uh, later, a few weeks later, we met with uh, Minister Osborne uh, of Finance, who said that no, it was Health that was responsible for negotiating. And so then Health told us they were not ready yet. Despite that, the finance minister today said negotiations with doctors aren't his issue. My department are responsible for negotiations with CUPE, with NAEP, uh, Allied Health, uh, for example, as, as well as other unions. Um, in this particular regard, with the, uh, you know, this, uh, the, the bargaining unit you, you've just mentioned, uh, we provide um, advice to the Department of Health. But, you know, it, again, it's, it's more of an issue to ask the Department of Health. I mean, even today, we find out that he's not involved in negotiations with the NLMA. The Minister of Finance is not involved with negotiations. I don't buy that. I don't buy it at all. Health Minister John Hagee's office says negotiations will start with doctors in the new year. But Dr. Fitzgerald doesn't think much of that without a commitment for a start date. Cease here, CBC News. St. John's. Another local tech industry startup is getting a boost from major venture capital investment. Legal software company Rally secured three quarters of a million dollars from private investors both inside and outside of the province. The two-year-old company is working to automate legal documents and build a way for clients to interact with their lawyers online. At the announcement today, CEO Scott Stevenson said the money will go toward hiring more people, developing new software features and expanding into other parts of Canada and the U.S. The province's startup industry has been on a streak lately and Stevenson says the more established entrepreneurs are helping out the up-and-comers. I was able to look to other companies that had made it and gone on to become successes for, for support and advice. Um, and that has been crucial. The amount of learning that happens between you know, companies like Verifin, uh, Heorca, uh, Misa and Colab Software, all of these companies are supporting uh, the entrepreneurs that come behind them. And, and each new company is doing things faster and more efficiently because they can learn from the mistakes of others.
It's Christmas time in St. John's. You're coming to the mall to get your Christmas gifts. Why not give a gift to the whole community? CBC's Feed at L Day is Thursday, December 12th. We'll have live music from Damian Follett and other great artists. CBC personalities will be here to wrap your Christmas gifts. And best of all, we're raising funds for your local food bank. Make sure no one in this province goes hungry this Christmas. And on Thursday, December 12th, we'll make sure everyone at the Avalon Mall stays merry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Can you hear me yes. now? <laughs> Maybe not Sorry about and that. Now everybody knows that Carolyn has her microphone surgically implanted in her leg. So embarrassing. <laughs> Anyways, let's it move happens. on. Let's do that. <laughs> so Environment Canada tweeted out some interesting information uh, that I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Okay. Uh, the wettest November on record, four places in the province had the wettest huh. uh, November on record. Okay. And it was between 173 and 214 millimeters of rain. So let's just have a quick look. I did a little board to show us the four places. So Stephenville, yeah. you had the wettest November on record. And Fort Schwab, so did you and Lancelou and Mary's Harbor. So if you guys live uh, in any of those areas, well, you had a pretty wet November, the wettest on record. So let's have a look at the highs today. 12 degrees in St. John's. It was just amazing. Lots of double digit temperatures in the east. Things cooling down though uh, throughout the day. And uh, we had that wind warning still in effect for the Nain area down through uh, Rigolette. So things uh, that will likely uh, be uh, easing at about midnight tonight. So it shouldn't be lasting much longer. We have a blowing snow advisory still in place as well for those areas, but that should ease overnight as you can see here. So we do have some showers in the east turning to snow overnight. Five millimeters of rain to start. That should be over pretty soon. And then we'll have that switch over. Could see about 10 centimeters uh, of snow with minus six as the overnight low. Five centimeters for the Marystown area and uh, some flurries on the west coast as as well in Labrador, things are very, very cold. Look at Lab City, minus 32 as the overnight low, but with that wind chill, gonna feel like minus 42 tonight. So tomorrow we do have uh, this special weather statement in effect for the West Coast. This should take effect later on in the afternoon. About five to ten centimeters of snow and some strong winds could cause some uh, snow squalls later in the afternoon by the time you're driving home from work, really. So uh, this is how it's going to play out. You can see the flurries moving through in the afternoon. Fairly clear in the east as well for Labrador tomorrow, but uh, later in the afternoon, the east and uh, northeast should start to see some of those flurries. So minus five in St. John's tomorrow, quite the difference than the 12 degrees that we had today. And with that wind chill minus 13, it's gonna feel like tomorrow with those afternoon flurries for central uh, minus three in Gander with those uh, afternoon flurries and uh, going to feel more like minus 17 there. And along the south coast, that's where we have a risk of snow squalls. The wind gusts there are going to be upwards of 80 kilometers an hour as well for the Port of Basque, Burgio area and uh, even colder with the wind chill in the west, minus 18. And the Quarterbrook area, Stephenville, could see about five to 10 centimeters of snow tomorrow that could be uh, blowing around in the afternoon. For the Straits areas, lots of sunshine and cool temperatures, minus 23 as the wind chill there. And for the rest of Labrador, it's gonna stay very cold in Lab City tomorrow, minus 23, but minus 36 with that wind chill. So Environment Canada is warning that frostbite could happen within minutes. But we do have another warm up coming up on the weekend. I'll tell you about that later. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, it's not even Christmas yet, but high school students are already thinking about what they would like to do after they graduate. And yesterday, people with all sorts of different jobs set up shop at Holy Spirit High in CBS for a career fair. Rotary Club of Avalon East, they were the organizer, and they chose careers that students had specifically asked to learn more about. And one of those careers was journalism. Our own Zach Gowdy was invited to take part, and while he was there as a reporter, he naturally couldn't resist asking some questions of his own. Good morning, Newfoundland. <laughs> Today I'm here with, what's your name? My name is Zach Gowdy. Zach Gowdy. Oh, I heard of you, actually. Oh. Well, this is the third annual career fair here at Holy Spirit High School. 
students have requested uh, that they meet with certain occupations and we're trying to make that happen for them. So that's what we're about today. What careers here attracted your attention? The airline traffic control. Oh yeah, what about that? I don't know, I like working with the airlines, I like traveling, so. I went to the police officers and that was really interesting. And I went over to the iron worker and that was really cool too, and the crane operator and just a lot of cool information. I went to um, an iron worker, a crane operator, and animator. And uh, which of those was your favorite? I like the animator. I don't know, he had a video that he showed and he drew everything, so I found that really cool that it was all drawn. Can you tell us a bit about your table? What kind of young potential students have you been receiving? I've been uh, speaking with a lot of young people. People are interested in cameras, photography, videography, mm -hmm. video editing, and I've just been telling people that journalism is the best because every day is different. Which careers did I check out today? First I went over to the writer, very inspirational man. Yeah, uh, The writer actually was Bruce Templeton, the famous Santa Claus. What did you learn from him? I learned a lot of things from him. I learned that I want to do something in life that's creative and not, not just plain follow a script, you know? <laughs> you sound like you know what you're doing. That's uh, awesome. All try. right. Good night. <laughs>Fortunately, with the very difficult uh, market conditions right now in the fur industry, um, the business model no longer made sense for us. A blow tonight for the province's fur industry. The operators of a mink farm are getting ready to shut down. Find out why.
Welcome back. The province's struggling fur breeding industry has been hit yet again. A mink farm on the west coast is going to close. It's the latest in a string of closures during a prolonged slump in the market. Here now's Terry Roberts explains. Here's some playful scenes from the new mink fur farm in Cox's Cove during better days. This sprawling mink farm owned by the Berry Group is pelting out, closing shop. The business model no longer made sense for us. Global fur production has collapsed in recent years, hit hard by weakening markets in China and Russia, and an anti-fur lobby that has scored some big victories. So an industry once hailed for its growth and success is now buckling. Worldwide pelt production is collapsing from a high of 100 million mink pelts five years ago to less than a third of that number today. What we're seeing here in Newfoundland and Labrador is just as we're seeing globally, there is a market correction. There are fewer farms in this province, and this operation in Cavendish, Trinity Bay, has become the industry's backbone. But thanks to some competitive advantage, pelt production in this province has not tanked like it has in Nova Scotia. That's because there's an affordable food supply. We take all of the waste material from our poultry operation. We take a lot of the material from our fish plants, and that's what we recycle into high-quality feed for the mink. And fur farming stalwarts are not ready to predict the demise of this business. As this operational uh, reorganization occurs, the industry that's left could be very, very strong, very robust, because there still will be a demand for fur. I mean, we will reach a point where, uh, and we'll probably reach it very soon, where there's actually a shortage and where production is less than what the demand is. So I think once we reach that point, we're going to see prices begin to increase. As for the 15 people impacted by the closure of the farm in Cox's Cove, they won't be without work. So it has been our priority to make sure that all of those people will be looked after within our, um, within our fish plant. Terry Roberts, CBC News. St. John's. To another business story now, a production center in Nain is working on a product with the aim of saving people's lives. Smart Ice is creating Smart Boys. The award-winning Inuit-led program is expanding and it's using the opportunity to train young people. Jacob Barker with that story. This is a new opportunity. These are meant to save lives. We, we have to adapt to the climate change and building Smart Boys is one way that we're doing. So what's a smart boy? We cut a hole in the ice, we put it in and it floats. And what it does, it, it measures temperature of the water. And it, what we're mainly concerned about is it's measuring the sea ice thickness. Using an app, people can get real-time information. Important when deciding how to plot your course on the ice. Very important according to a recent survey done by the Nunatsiavut government. It found 75% of people weren't confident going out on the ice and 1 in 12 have gone through it at some point. We use the smart boys with traditional inward knowledge. So at the end of it is we help keep people safe from falling into the ice. And the project is creating work too. Starting with nearly a million dollars in funding from the federal, provincial and Nunatsiavut governments, it gives youth workers like Ama Harris an employment opportunity. I thought it would be hard at first, but once I got used to it, it started getting a little easier. And peace of mind. The ice gets like a slushy and not safe, I guess, when we hauling a load of wood. It's to uh, make sure that we're safe. Rex, I just go put it in. 21-year-old <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Renee Semiak also enjoys working on the project. It gives her a sense of pride. Why are you proud of doing it? Because we're the ones that built it. This is another backwards. They've managed to create six of the smart boys this year, but have orders for many more. The hope is to get them into other Inuit communities in Canada and one day to ship them all over the world. We're the only people doing this stuff and to be made by Inuit people, being pioneers, if you want to say. Um, you know, unfortunately with climate change, this is going to hopefully expand a lot. more. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Nain. Well, staying with ice, a team of polar scientists from across the globe is studying Greenland's ice loss. It's the most thorough study of its kind, and researchers from Memorial University are taking part in this. Jane Aidy, host of the broadcast, swung by Mun to learn more about this province's role in the study. My name is Lev Tarasov. I'm a professor here at Mun, and I basically explore um, how ice and climate interact with each other going back thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of years, and looking at how they will evolve into the future. 
looking, we started back to around the 1980s. In the first decade, the ice sheets were quite constant. They weren't doing much, or, nor, at least the Greenland ice sheet. Then around the mid-90s, we started to see a bit of changes. It was hard to tell then. The initial studies way back then, um, we couldn't really tell. We just knew it was roughly zero change. Um, by the early 2000s, the studies were becoming quite clear. There was a large acceleration in, in mass loss, of loss of ice from the ice sheet. This is only the start. We expect more acceleration. By the end of the century, Greenland alone will probably could contribute anywhere between 5, 10, maybe up to 20 centimeters. And that's just Greenland. Um, maybe just to give you some perspective. Right. So here's Canada. We can see Greenland right there. It's not that big. It's compared to Green, um, Canada, it's much smaller. An even bigger concern is Antarctica. Right. Much larger. It's about 10 times as much ice as Greenland. Uh, for reference, Greenland, if all of it melted, sea level would rise about 6 meters. Water Street would definitely become Water Street in St. John's. Um, if all of Antarctica melted, it wouldn't really happen, but if it could, sea level would rise m around 60 meters. Um, the part we're more concerned about is West Antarctica, and that's a very dynamic region. There we could maybe, within the next few hundred years, see contributions of a meter or a few meters of sea level rise. On top of that, we have, ice uh, we have lots of glaciers which are melting. Um, I know conferences I've been to, the, the uh, the Swiss are very concerned about it. They're even talking about putting large tarps over some of their um, glaciers to try to protect them through the summer. Um, and we have the ocean warming. Warm water expands. And that's actually about half the contribution of sea level rise right now is just from warming ocean. To me, Newfoundland in some ways should be kind of a, a beacon of dealing with climate change. Because one of the biggest issues with climate change is, also, is not even the things we can predict, it's what we call the tipping points when there's a major switch. Newfoundland's been through a tipping point in some sense when we lost the cod stocks, right? That was uh, an amazing fishery. I remember reading in grade five Canadian history, right? How the early explorers couldn't even barely row to shore because there was so much cod in the, in the water. Why are we at this stage? We've lost a major resource. And yet this is peanuts to compare to what the globe might be, fa the world might be facing. So hopefully um, the experiences in Newfoundland, if people could consider them, put them in perspective, Maybe you can use them as a way to make Newfoundland a shining example of how to deal with these kind of issues. I mean, think about the environment. One individual has increasingly emerged as the face of youth climate activism. And today, Greta Thunberg was named Time's Person of the Year. The 16-year-old is the youngest person ever chosen for the magazine's top honour. The Person of the Year announcement as an annual tradition goes back 92 years. In August of 2018, Thunberg began skipping class once a week to protest outside the Swedish Parliament. And she has since galvanized millions to join her calls for real action. Many have welcomed Thunberg's urgent message to stop global warming, while others have criticized the teenager's sometimes combative tone. And now, what do I have to listen to? I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. She was larger than life and did not hold back. Journalist and commentator Mark Carney has passed away. We'll bring you one of her last commentaries for Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here Now. One of the first female journalists in this province has died. Mark Carney was 94 years of age. Last month when I heard that rumor, the fact that the people in this province, when they get to be the age of 80, are going to have to give up their license. If there was ever a stupid idea, it's that one. Carney never held back with her opinions. She had been writing and performing commentaries for CBC starting back in the 1960s. And that led to an extensive career as a journalist, broadcaster as well, after she had served in the Navy. Carney worked for the Daily News, the Evening Telegram, as well as CBC and VOCM, and was a well-known personality in the province. Carney received the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador in 2014. Well, here's a look at one of the last commentaries that Mark did for Here and Now, and it's quite timely and topical this time of year. Do you hear what I hear? Nothing. No music. No noise. It's a shopper's paradise. I can shop. I can think. And I think it's absolutely wonderful. Merchants need us to stay in business. We need the merchants to carry the things that we want to buy. However, in my opinion, the merchants do us no favor by hammering our ears with Christmas music as early as November the 15th. In my opinion, it's wrong. I'm old enough to remember when the CBC did not play any Christmas music until December the 15th. And when it came, it was an absolutely sheer delight. The announcers went to a great deal of trouble to make such a difference in our lives. We heard Christmas music from Vienna, from Germany, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Wales, from France. And now, what do I have to listen to? I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. And what's more, the fallout for me is that I've personally lost interest in all the lovely, lovely Christmas music I have at home. I'm so tired and weary of hearing the awful music that comes out of the ceilings in the stores where I shop. My Christmas wish for all of you is that we don't hear any Christmas music next year until December the 15th. This is Margaret Carney for Here and Now. Um, personally, I feel a warm meal is being able to um, stay together with family and share a very delicious meal on a Christmas day. Yeah. The food bank does a really important job, especially in the holidays, to have people, have everybody enjoy that Christmas spirit. A warm meal means comfort. Uh, a warm meal means a full belly. Yeah, a warm meal for me sounds like family and sounds like uh, good times. <laughs> uh, to me it means community. A warm meal means a kitchen stock with ingredients to make it. It means a lot to me that I have the uh, capacity to have a nice warm meal. A warm meal can warm more than one cup. One warm meal won't solve food insecurity on the East Coast. But at least it's a start. Hi, I'm Debbie Forward, President of the Registered Nurses Union, and I'm delighted today to be donating $6,000 to the Community Food Sharing Association on behalf of all of our members across Newfoundland and Labrador. As registered nurses, we know how important food security is to people's health, both their physical health and their mental health. And whether registered nurses are working in the community or in the long-term care sector, or in acute care. They see every day individuals who are having to make choices about whether they put food on the table or whether they buy their medications, whether they go out and buy some food or whether they pay for their heat or their light. And we also know how important good food is to maintaining people's health. So we're very pleased to be able to provide this donation to great organizations across the province who will provide families and individuals in need over, not just over Christmas time, but throughout the year. To donate to a food bank in your area, visit cbc.ca slash warmhearts. 
and I guarantee it will warm your heart. Welcome back. Carolyn mentioned uh, 12 degrees. Yeah, that was today. the high today. It was very mild. And some more warmth coming. Yeah, it well, is. it's going to, the temperatures are really going to take a dive over the next few days, but it looks like there may be another rain system coming through on Sunday, okay. and that could lead to a warm up. So let's have a look at the long, long range. Going to start with a recap of this special weather statement that's in effect for the West Coast. This is really for uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, some snow and high winds. Winds uh, from Gross Morn down to Port of Bass could cause some uh, snow squalls, blowing snow in the afternoon tomorrow. Minus five as the high in St. John's tomorrow with some afternoon flurries. Windy along the south coast, two to four centimeters in Port of Bass, five to ten for the Corner Brook area, and uh, minus 11 in St. Anthony as the high tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud. For Labrador, cool temperatures and sunny skies for most up there in Lab City. Once again, we have that cold wind chill minus 36 uh, during the day tomorrow. So you're definitely going to want to bundle up. So looking ahead to Friday, things clear off for mostly everybody uh, except for the West Coast. More flurries on the way for the Corner Brook, Port of Basque area. St. John's looking at a high of minus six, so significantly cooler over the next few days than it was today at uh, 12 degrees. So uh, minus eight as well for central areas and staying cool and sunny in a Labrador pushing ahead to the weekend. Now things are going to look nice for mostly everybody on uh, Saturday. But as we move into Sunday, this is the, the the rain system that I was talking about that could cause a bit of a warm up. So on Saturday for Eastern Newfoundland, looking at a mix of sun and cloud at, and minus one as the high. But then we could see another bump up to nine degrees on Sunday as that rain comes through and then back to the freezing mark on Monday and for central areas, a similar story there. Some uh, flurries on Saturday, zero as the high, eight degrees there on Sunday, and then cooling down once again as we get into Monday. And uh, 
Also similar story for western Newfoundland, looking at some rain on Sunday and then some flurries on Monday as temperatures start to take a dip there for uh, eastern Labrador. A significant warm up really if you think about it, even though it's still in the minus degrees, uh, 18, uh, minus 18 for Saturday and then minus 2 on Sunday and continuing around uh, that uh, temperature as we head into the work week. And for western Labrador, some flurries on the weekend and continuing in to Monday. And that's your forecast. Anthony. Thanks, Carolyn. The federal government has approved New Brunswick's carbon tax proposal, which means in April, consumers there will pay a different rate than the federal one. New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs was among conservative premiers challenging the national plan to curb greenhouse gas emissions with a minimum price on carbon, but he changed his position after nearly two-thirds of New Brunswick voters picked a party supportive of a carbon tax in October's federal election. Consumers in New Brunswick are set to pay $30 per ton pending the legislation getting passed in the province's legislature. A nice festive uh, viewer photo for you. Love this with the uh, mountains in the background. I'll give you a hint about where this is. Uh, this area in the province is seeing some uh, pretty significant blowing snow and wind okay. this evening. So if you were paying attention to the weather earlier. They're all, they're all snug in the <laughs> shed though. Absolutely, I'll let you know where this was taken after the break. Some troubling testimony today at a hearing on the safety of the Boeing 737 MAX aircraft and the credibility of the U.S. regulator that allowed that aircraft to fly. The FAA didn't ground the plane until two crashes left 346 people dead. But an investigation shows the FAA knew the aircraft posed risks. Today, a retired FAA aerospace engineer and a former Boeing manager offered damning assessments of both workplaces. Bottom line is the 737 factory needs to be thoroughly investigated 
and closely monitored by regulatory authorities, specifically the FAA, on a continuous basis. Safety was their highest priority when I started working at the FAA in 1989. However, FAA management culture has shifted to where the wants of applicants now often take precedent over the safety of the traveling public. The Congressional Committee raised questions about whether Boeing was putting profit ahead of safety and about why the FAA did not act on its information that the plane was liable to have problems. The former Boeing manager says he had raised concerns about quality control with the company well before those crashes happened. Well, on to a different, completely different kind of story. Police on one of India's busiest streets are no dummies when it comes to traffic control. No, but they are making use of some dummies, that is. They're alternating between real-life officers and mannequins at traffic stops. By doing so, we are confusing. We want to confuse these habitual road uh, traffic rule violators. Now, from a distance, the dummies look real, so drivers actually slow down. And up close, they can soon tell it's fake. It's a pretty As good you, idea. Yeah, go for a <laughs> selfie. But, you know, if they speed up next time, it could be a real officer. You never really know. So police say adding the fake cops has actually cut down on speeding. It has, however, also caused traffic jams, and that's because tourists, as you saw a moment ago, keep stopping to take selfies with these dummies. Idea. All right, we have just enough time to have a look at the weather photo. Love this one. It almost looks like black and white in the background. This was taken Way in Postville. So thank you very much uh, to Gail Flowers for sending this in. She titled it Calm Before the Storm because uh, lots of nasty weather up in that area. Calm Before the Storm. Yes. Uh, a bit of fun before our own Christmas storm tomorrow at the mall. Hope you can make it tomorrow. A special edition of Here and Now. Something of a tradition. We'll see you then. Good night.